Then, indeed, I'm a pediatric oncologist, but I do mainly uh, adolescents and young adults. I'm not seeing the little ones anymore, uh, and mainly bone sarcoma. And I'm chairing the FOSTER, which is the uh, fight uh, um, osteosarcoma through European Research Consortium. But I'm also part of the Eurowing Consortium, and I will try to show you what has been done there. Uh, take home message, then you can read them. Uh, we will go through them uh, all along, and you will see them at the end. Then first thing, just to remind you, it's uh, mainly an adolescent and young adult uh, pet disease, but you can see it across all age. There is uh, some more males than female, and there is a, a, a predominance of uh, Ewing sarcoma in the Caucasian population, and probably this is due to the genetic um, uh, of the population. Um, it's mainly uh, swelling, uh, painful swelling uh, in the axial axis, but it can be also on the long bones, and when it's on the long bone, it's more on the diaphysis. And you have to be very careful when you have a nerve compression and painful uh, nerve um, sciatics. How do you say sciatics? Uh, sciatics. <laughs> then uh, to be uh, to be careful about uh, is it not a uh, um, sarcoma of the of the spine and there is around 15 percent of this lesion that can be completely outside the bone and just soft tissue sarcomas um, and what is important is uh, the uh, to look at the metastatic status at diagnosis because this is one of the major pronostic factor the main localization of the metastases are in the lung, and you can see that the lung patient, the patients that have just lung metastases, have an intermediate uh, prognosis between the localized patient and those that have uh, met uh, outside. The way to look into the other metastases, which are mainly on the bone and the bone marrow, is now becoming a standard. It's the PET scan. Uh, but before we were doing bone scintigraphy and bone marrow aspiration, uh, there are some centers that still do bone marrow um, biopsy, not aspiration, bone marrow biopsy. Um, and if you cannot do the PET scan, you still have to do it. Um, the main localization of this uh, bone and bone marrow metastases where, where the bone marrow is the more active means in the axial skeleton, then there is also some uh, centers that are doing axial RMI to look for the metastasis. Uh, now, the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma cannot be done without looking for the molecular biology of this tumor. Uh, a long time ago, it was just a small round cell tumor, CD99 positive. Uh, and, uh, it was already known that the, uh, there was a specific translocation between the 11 and the 22 chromosome, but now we ca you cannot do uh, the diagnosis of Ewing's without knowing the, bio the molecular biology. Why? Because uh, in the later time, uh, they were supposed to have like 20% of Ewing's that were negative for the transcript, which now we know is not necessarily Ewing's because some of them can be because in vitro the D3 um, uh, sarcomas, or other can be six-dux cat, uh, six-dux four, sorry, half, half French, half English, I'm really sorry. <laughs> six-dux four uh, sarcomas, uh, which we know now that has a very different prognosis when you treat them as Ewing sarcoma, even if we don't know yet how to treat them differently. Then it's really important to have this molecular uh, confirmation, whatever the techniques you use. Um, uh, Ewing sarcoma uh, was uh, a long time ago uh, with uh, Mr. James Ewing um, as known to be a very radiosensitive tumor then, uh, and it was for a long time the only treatment that uh, they had is to do radiotherapy on the local re on the primary tumor. The problem was that the patients were dying of lung metastasis quite a few months ago. Uh, then basically what has changed the, pro the prognosis of Ewing sarcoma is the introduction of chemotherapy in the 60s, 70s. Uh, first, uh, concomitant to radiotherapy, and then uh, the uh, implementation of surgery to improve the local treatment, first by removing the bone that didn't need reconstruction, like ribs or, or fibula, and then by the progress that has been made in osteosarcoma in particular uh, with the uh, the repressment surgery uh, that was introduced also in Ewing sarcoma. Then now the standard of care is to have chemotherapy, local treatment with su surgery when it's feasible, 
and uh, re more or less radiotherapy, then chemotherapy to consolidate the treatment. Um, in that protocol that was the same, the IS and the Oberlin protocol, was the chemotherapy was exactly the same. The only difference was the surgery made. Um, and in the first case where you were doing surgery only for removable bone without reconstruction, the main problem was called relapse. Once we have changed the surgery to make surgery for whenever it was possible, then we decreased the, the, the amount of local relapse. Then local treatment is very important. Uh, post, uh, um, then we have switched from exclusive radiotherapy to post-operative radiotherapy. Uh, and this post-operative radiotherapy is still important, even if the patients that have the, the best prognosis uh, with the treatment that we do. For example, here in the local, real, local patients, local disease with good response uh, to chemotherapy, the radiotherapy still benefits. Then that's a huge question to be asked on the tumor board, do we need or not to do the radiotherapy to the patients? There are some discussion more recently, and some countries are doing more than others, preoperative radiotherapy, but it's not a standard of, complete standard of care is discussed when, the, when we know that the surgery can be difficult and might not be complete. Um, and there is some uh, patients that will uh, have exclusive radiotherapy, either because the surgery is too complicated or because of the localization. Uh, then local, why is local control important? Um, because if you have a local relapse, then you are nearly sure that your patient will not survive the disease. Um, a local relapse uh, is as difficult as a metastatic relapse already because half of this local relapse are already uh, associated with metastasis and those that are not associated will do a metastatic relapse later. Then failing the local treatment is failing your patient. Um, but local treatment is not whole. We need the chemotherapy to control this metastasis. There have been several, um, then initially alkylating agents were the ones that were more used with vancristine and uh, actinomycin. Then what has made a big difference is the introduction of adriamycin to control the metastasis uh, in the late uh, 70s. And then in the late 80s, the addition of etoposide aphosphamide uh, to for patients with local disease. What we learn when we start using the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the way that uh, of uh, response of Ewing sarcoma with a usually big masses outside the bone and a very huge shrinkage, very rapid shrinkage of the tumor under chemotherapy. And if you ask your patients how do they feel after the first course of chemotherapy, they already tell you I have less pain and the tumor has started to shrink. Then something that can be very rapid. Uh, and we uh, discover a new prognostic factor, which was the histological response to chemotherapy. Then after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, when you do the surgery, you look at the percentage of necrosis or viable cells that are remaining on the bone. And this is uh, the most important prognostic factor in localized patients, even more important than the initial tumor volume that was up to there, the main prognostic factor in localized patients. What we discover also by intensifying the treatment is the late effect because the patients were now, so where they, when they were surviving around 20%, they are now surviving around 70%. Then uh, by the, this increase in survival, you discover all the late effect of these therapies. You have here a patient from Odile Berlin that I don't know if anyone knows Adila Berlin, but uh, uh, she was my mentor and she treated the two years old with hearing sarcoma of the humerus. And as you see, the patient has grown, survived at least up to 27, but the humerus has not. Um, and uh, there is uh, also uh, the uh, increased risk of second, ca secondary cancer uh, after radiotherapy, but not just after radiotherapy, because we know now that chemotherapy can also induce uh, second cancer. Um, there is, all, of course, the risk that are linked to the chemotherapy that you are using, using cardiac toxicity with the anthracycline, fertility toxicity, renal toxicity with the alkylating agent, and, of course, surgery, especially if you are doing surgery in a very small child and he will continue to grow, then uh, sequel can be uh, much more higher. 
then basically the treatment is now biopsy, and biopsy is part of the treatment if you, you have to do it right. Uh, chemo, neodadjuvant chemotherapy, local treatment by surgery plus or minus radiotherapy, and chemotherapy afterwards. Two goals, uh, improve survival by a better control of the metastasis, and uh, the decrease as much as you can the late, the, the late effects, especially in growing patients. For that, the importance of the expertise is uh, uh, um, highlighted by these two publications, showing that there is an improvement of the survival of the patient when they are referred to expert centers. And main, the main cause of that is the fact that the discussion on the multidisciplinary tumor board is much more, uh, has much more expertise. And uh, this expertise is also shared in pediatrics across Europe through this international uh, molecule, uh, tumor board uh, that is set up by the Germany. Um, then we have tried to improve again uh, the, the treatments of these patients and uh, those intensity is the thing that uh, appear to be very important in this disease. Then you have to use the main drugs, uh, alkylating agent, adriamycin, uh, etoposidase phosphamide, but you also have to increase the dose intensity. Two ways of doing it. Um, you can increase the dose of the chemotherapy this is the high dose chemotherapy, and they have been, uh, that has been the main question of the Euro Wing, 2000, uh, the Euro -Wing 29, uh, 99 trial uh, during the, the, the late, uh, the, the beginning of the 21st century, uh, where they were using uh, high dose chemotherapy versus conventional therapy for the patients that have the highest risk, the localized patient with the highest risk, mean the patient that have poor histological response. What they show is that BIMEL increased the survival uh, compared to conventional chemotherapy. At the, more or less at the same time, the Americans were doing a different way. They are also uh, doing dose intensity, but not by increasing the dose of chemotherapy, but by compressing the regimen. Then they have shown that doing VDCIA VDCIE in two weeks rather than every, every two weeks rather than every three weeks uh, was benefit, beneficial to the patient in terms of control of the disease. Um, uh, then we compare both. We compare the uh, European attitude with VIDE induction chemotherapy and high dose chemotherapy and the VDCIE, VDCIE compressed regimen from the Americans in the Euro Wing 2012 uh, protocol. Uh, and clearly, the VDCIE was, be VDCIE was better than the, um, the, the addition of BIMEL. The problem is that in that trial, uh, v patients that receive VIDE most of them did not receive the high dose chemotherapy because at that time we were waiting for the results of the Euro Wing 99. That means that we have not compared the full strategy VIDA plus, plus high dose chemotherapy, but simply the VIDA plus conventional chemotherapy versus VDCIE. Then the role of um, high dose chemotherapy for patients that have received compressed VDCIE, we don't know it. Uh, and we will probably never know it because the Euro Wing 99 trial took 15 years to be done, to be completed, and we will never repeat that again. Then now the standard of care is to do VDCIE uh, according to the Euro Wing 2012. But as you can see, if we compare this to the original protocol, the local therapy was not at the same time because we did the local therapy at the same time that it was done when you were treating patients with VDCIE. Then we don't know what is the role of the timing of the, the local treatment. Then that's maybe something that we will try to answer retrospecti retrospectively and we have a, um, a project uh, all together Americans and Europeans to try to pull all clinical data of bone tumors in one pediatric data common to be able to answer that kind of questions. Uh, then what we try to do best after that, <laughs> we try to uh, increase the chemotherapy. Uh, American has increased, I have tried to introduce topotecon and temeri to the VDCI regimen. They failed, probably because we lose those, those intensity uh, doing that. Uh, they are, 
been trying to uh, add um, uh, targeted therapy, uh, especially anti-IGFNR uh, uh, treatment, and again, it fails for other reasons, probably. <laughs> We, are tried that, we have tried then to also uh, target the microenvironment of the, of the tumor, as it's a bone tumor, to try to target the bone microenvironment with zoledronic acid, and we failed again. <laughs> but uh, probably the power of the study were underestimating. We initially plan, we have, we have two different protocols in Europe, one uh, coming from the Euroin Consortium, one coming for, the Gem for Germany. Uh, we initially planned to analyze both trials uh, together, but this has never been done for the moment. What about uh, lung metastatic only? If you remember, I told you that they have an intermediate uh, prognosis compared to localized patient and multimetastatic patient. The Eurowing 99 compare uh, high dose chemotherapy as consolidation versus conventional chemotherapy plus lung irradiation and the results were more or less the same, then both can be used. The community has decided not to use Bumel uh, because of the toxicity that is expected with high dose chemotherapy, in particular among fertility, uh, growth of the patient and everything. For multimetastatic patients, maybe dose intensity is not enough. Then treat, there was no randomization question in the Euro Ring 99 for this population. All were given VIDA and all receive Bumel, and you see that the um, survival of this patient is quite poor, around 30%. Um, and uh, there have been several attempts to try to improve that regimen. Some have tried uh, to do things upfront, others have tried to add to the Bumel the lung irradiation, uh, others have tried to uh, improve the patients in complete remission before the high dose chemotherapy with another high dose chemotherapy. Um, but nothing has changed the survival. Then the Germans have tried to uh, introduce another high dose chemotherapy, which was the triosulfan, and this time in a randomized way. But this did not improve the treatment. They had triosulfan melphalan plus the conventional chemotherapy. Again, no improvement. And if you look to what the Americans are doing, they are just doing VDCIE, conventional chemotherapy, without high-dose chemotherapy, and the survival is the same. Then, is high-dose chemotherapy useful in that situation? We don't know. There is a French study that is trying to combine both VDCIE plus high-dose chemotherapy, two ways of increasing dose intensity. And they are also trying to add a maintenance treatment for two years, as we know that most of these patients will relapse of the on the first year after uh, the, the, the end of the treatment. We don't have the results yet, maybe next year. Um, then what can we do better now? Uh, we can try to add new drugs. We can try to improve local treatment, as we said that both these things were important to be able to cure patients. And we can try also to, um, to see if maintenance therapy can be useful. Um, the only drug that has shown some efficacy in uh, urine sarcoma in the last 15 years of phase two trials uh, in relapse uh, urine sarcoma is multikinase inhibitors. Um, then we are trying to put them uh, in a first line treatment, we have started by a phase 1b because VDCIE is a quite intensive chemotherapy and we didn't know if we can do multikinase inhibitor at the same time of chemotherapy. Then the phase 1b is ongoing, uh, which, call, which is called Rigo Anterewing, led by uh, Pablo Berlanga at Gustave Rossi. And, the idea, and we have run it in the poor, poorest population in first line, which are the multimetastatic patients. If this, this regimen is tolerated by the patient, then the idea is to have a randomized trial in the interviewing one protocol at, as a first question uh, for all metastatic patients. We are trying also to improve the local control by uh, uh, two questions in terms of radiotherapy. First, to increase, increase the dose of radiotherapy for patients that receive exclusive radiotherapy. And the second one is to reduce the dose in patients uh, that are receiving, receiving post-operative chemotherapy. Sorry, it went too well. 
And the last question is a maintenance treatment with navelbin and duxan, as, as, as it's done in um, rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, there are other uh, trials that are asking the question of maintenance treatment with different drugs, but they are not phase three trials, they are phase two trials. There is one Italian trial with metformin and one trial with, uh, French trial with regorafenib, but both trials are for all bone tumors, not specific for, for specific for Ewing sarcoma, and they are phase, phase two, then maybe the, the power of the study will not be enough to say something, and they are single arm study now. But how can we improve things? <laughs> We can also try to select better the patients to be able to, um, to do appropriate treatment. At the moment, we have metastatic status and histological response as prognostic factor. Can we find prognostic factors uh, that not just predict the future, but help us to adapt the treatment, to change the treatment and, adapt and change the future? Uh, and going from prognostic factor to teranostic factor. That's the main goal of the biology. I don't have the answer today. We heard yesterday about the second hit uh, and especially STAC2, TP53, CDK2, CDK in 2A, but there are other ones that are currently being explored. Um, what the, the schema that you see in the middle that looks very complicated is how we have anticipated that kind of problematic and how in each of the trials that have been run in the Eurowing Consortium, we have planned biological sample collection, either tumor or blood or plasma, to be able to answer biological questions and change things. And we are not the only ones thinking like that because if you look to the ASCO that was run last week, uh, two of the overall presentation were on the same subject, how to identify patients um, from diagnosis, either by liquid biopsy or by se sequencing of the tumor or immunohistochemistry of the tumor to be able to do the treatment a bit differently. Um, that's it. Uh, then uh, in that trial, we also plan to have ancillary study on biology but we also plan to have ancillary study on radiology, especially to evaluate the new techniques to, for diagnosis, but also to evaluate how to follow the patients during the treatment. Coming to the relapse uh, studies, um, there is something that is rare in bone sarcoma, is that we are trying to work together to have a standard of care at relapse setting. Then there is a trial that has been set up in 2014, as maybe some of you have heard, which is the record trial uh, with an original design that was uh, a MAMS design, multi-arm, multi-stage. Basically, you treat some patients with different chemotherapy, the same number. Then you do an interim analysis, you drop the loser, and then you continue with the ones that you have. Then you do another interim analysis, you drop the loser, then you come up with two arms and you do a phase three. Um, and then what is interesting with that kind of schema is that you can come back and add new uh, arms and there are two new arms that have been added. Initially, it was just chemotherapy, then topocyclo, etoposide, um, uh, irinotecan temozolomide, gemcitabine docetaxel and idosiphosphamide. Then uh, um, the... Uh, Carboplatin etoposate was added, and now we are adding new drugs like multikinase inhibitor with iphosphamide. What we learn is that what we have done for years was quite wrong. It means that we evaluated new drugs using the response rates, uh, but response rate is not linked to survival in these patients. Then now we have changed the way of evaluating things and we are looking for progression-free survival rather than response rates. Because as you can see, you can have a very huge response to the chemotherapy, but at the end, you will not be able to cure your patients. What we learn also is that probably gemcitabine doxetaxel is doing worse than all the other chemotherapy. The winner was idosiphosphamide, but if you look to the curves, Idosiphosphamide, topocyclo, and irinotecan uh, temozolomide were more or less the same. Um, 
And if you look pairwise comparison, it's not so clear, because if you look to IFO uh, Temeri comparison, they are doing the same. Then it's a bit complicated, but basically, gemcitabine uh, docetaxel is probably worse than the others, but all the others are probably fine. Um, and what about other trials with RECUR trial? There have been a, we have done a review of about 13 years of phase two trial. They are all, were mostly using a, a response rate and the results were quite disappointing. There were only 18% of the trial that were considered as positive, but if you were looking to the statistical hypothesis and the results of the trial, for the same um, uh, response rate or the same PFS, you have trials that were considered positive and other that were considered negative. Then we are not sure that we can rely on that for, for, the, for these new drugs. Um, the other thing is that if we are, were very good in using SACOMA to work with medical oncologists from the beginning to try to include in trial patients that were representing the epidemiology of the disease, in phase two, we were not good at all because only 12% of the trial in phase two were including the whole population or at least covering 90% of the population. As most of the trial were starting at 18, while most of 90% of the relapsed are seen uh, above uh, 12. Um, and this is typically a disease where we need to work together, medical oncologist and pediatric oncologist. There have been several attempts. Initially, we, think, we thought that uh, Ewing sarcoma will be easy. One fusion, one target, and it will be solved. Problem is a, a transcription factor, and it's not easy to solve. There is one drug that was developed not to target the fusion, but to target the link of the fusion with the DNA. Um, but for the moment, we, it's not huge efficacy, as you see, because if you look to the PFS, it's a PFS of a trial that might be considered as negative for most of the people. Um, then it's not yet, uh, we are not yet there. There are other uh, ways to try to target this fusion, but they are not, uh, they are still ongoing. Not working anymore. Um, then we try to target the downstream pathway of the fusion. Uh, the anti-NGFR was the most uh, uh, famous one uh, with huge ripples seen in phase two. The problem is that after a few months, disease was relapsing. There were at the end very few patients that were really responding to the, to the treatment and we are not still able 20 years after to identify them. Uh, and if we want to try a combination of the, with that, we don't know exactly which combination is important. Um, and then what <laughs> makes an end to the anti-HFR story was the phase three of the Americans in first line that was shown to be negative. But there are other potential targets that we can try to use, but we don't know if it's efficient. At the end, what was the most effi efficient up to now was the multi-target uh, um, drugs and they have been used alone and now they are trying to be used in combination uh, either with uh, immune therapy like anti-PD-1 inhibitors or with chemotherapy uh, as uh, ephosphamide um, uh, here. Um, the PARP inhibitors were, or DNA repair in general, and PARP inhibitor in particular, Ewing sarcoma were shown in vitro and in vivo to be very sensitive to that kind of drug, especially when you associate them with um, temozolomide or irinotecan. Again, a long trial that has been stopped because the, the accrual was poor. Um, the only trial that recruited was the ISMA trial, which was not specific uh, to Ewing sarcomas, where some response have been seen, but for the moment, uh, due to the toxicity of the combination, this has not been introduced in first-line treatments. There are other, there are other um, uh, tar the, the way to target the DNA repair, and there are association of PARP inhibitor and ATR inhibitor that are being tested, CDK4, CDK6 inhibitor, and there are some coming like the R5 antagonist. Uh, 
such, a tr such the molecular profiling in Ewing sarcoma is a huge debate because probably it will not be useful for your patients as most of the patients will not have additional target than those that we already know, which are the transcript and the second hits that I've shown you, and none of them are targetable at the moment. Um, but still important for two things, to learn from the disease and maybe do differently in a few years' time. And the second thing is that even if uh, they can gi give patients access to trials that require that kind of uh, uh, analysis to, like ISMART. Um, this is the slides that I have shown when I have started uh, in Ewing's in 2015 uh, on the drugs that can be used. Um, and if you look at that schema, nothing has really changed since 10 years, except that we have maybe a signal of activity for multi-kinase inhibitor. All the other ones have failed or still in um, discussion and in evaluation. Uh, immune therapy was also a big failure for uh, all the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor, uh, but we since then understand why, because it's a cold tumor, then we were not expecting them to work, but we didn't know at that time. Uh, there are some CAR T cell that is uh, arriving in that tumor, but using um, uh, anti-GD2 or EGFR, are they the best target for Ewing sarcoma, we are not sure, but we'll see. Maybe it will be helpful for a very subset of patients. Um, and then uh, what about uh, antibody drug conjugates? Uh, most of these antibody drug conjugates are using irinotecant, where we know it's efficient in uh, Ewing sarcoma. Then how can we use them now um, as a, um, uh, in the treatment of this uh, disease? Um, then that's something to explore. Uh, but I don't know if we can call antibody drug conjugate immune therapy, maybe it's just a targeted chemotherapy. Um, and uh, this is an update that was done three, or two, three weeks ago at SIOPI, and as you see, not much more has happened. Um, then I think what is important there is not to think that we have not succeeded in anything because we have improve the survival of the patient. We have strong biology group working together uh, and we are trying to harmonize as much things as we can to standardize the treatment of this patient, especially for local treatment and for other things. Then, if we go back to the take home message, chemotherapy dose intensity is key uh, in uh, Ewing sarcoma and VDCIE has become the standard. Remain the question of the usefulness of high dose chemotherapy. Uh, but we will not be able to answer that question. Optimization of local treatment is key, key. and for that you need a very strong multi-tumor board, a multidisciplinary tumor board, and you need to rely on your expert centers. Um, even if you are treating them in an institution where there is small patients, do not hesitate to refer to the expert centers because they will see much more patients than you and they can guide you on the, on the treatment of these patients. Multi-kinase inhibitor are probably interesting, but we need, how, we need to understand how to use them in relapse, in combination, in first-line treatment, and this is what we are exploring at the moment. Uh, and beyond uh, the how to treat patient definition, what is the biology of this tumor that will make us make a step forward uh, to uh, a, a risk-adapted therapy uh, to these patients? That's the role of the biologist and the uh, link that we have with the biologist and the clinical trial with the biologist is very important. Relapse remains chemosensitive but not chemotreble. Then try to include your patients in clinical trial when there are clinical trial open because maybe we will learn more about that and maybe you will, have, will, you will be useful for your patient or at least for the next ones. Um, and collaboration between medical on and pediatric oncologists is absolutely crucial, especially for the early phase. Do not stop at, we have no trial in pediatrics, and go and see your medical uh, colleague to be sure that uh, uh, there is not a trial available in adult population. And try to open your trial regardless of the age. Um, you have to stick to the epidemiology of the disease and not uh, to the age of the patients when he's included in the trial. 
Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Very interesting talk. I think there may be questions. I had a question on the um, TKIs. I saw that there was now a trial then open in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, but what's the rationale behind it? The rationale uh, is that maybe the cabozantinib makes the tumor, the multikinase in a, the multikinase inhibitor makes the tumor a little bit hot, and then the checkpoint can can work. But it's completely theoretical. It has works in other tumors uh, that were called tumors. Uh, then there is an extension of this uh, this thinking. I also had a question. Um, there is in the soft or the solid tumor world, we're very enthusiastic about uh, uh, ADCs, and I wonder what is what are your thoughts? Because I also hear some people say we don't deliver it as well as is suggested. It's a tumor cold uh, cold tumor, and I think it will depend on the target, <laughs> because. Um, Basically, if you are using a target that is not present on the tumor cells, I don't think they will work better than just chemotherapy. Uh, then the, the key on that therapy will be how to select the appropriate target for the appropriate disease. And it might not be something that is across all tumor. Um, then we'll see. But as they are conjugated with Irina taken, then that's clearly a chemotherapy that is useful for you, instead. May I ask one question up, uh, for the primary Ewing sarcomas with bone and or bone marrow involvement? How do you see the future for these patients? Primary disease. Yeah, primary disease, I see it in biology. <laughs> What I mean is that we need to understand the biology behind, because at the moment we do not, uh, and they are probably completely different patients from the other Ewing sarcomas. Then uh, all the studies that are ongoing will be very important, but this will not change the life of your patients today. Um, we are waiting also for the French results, because maybe the maintenance treatment can be helpful in these patients. Uh, the only problem of the French study is that it's a single arm study. Then it will be a historical comparison. And then I'm not sure how much the community will rely on the data. Uh, then we'll see. No more questions? Thank you, Natalie. Thank and, you. Uh, we'll go outside. <laughs>